to six month countdown, ready to homeschool. This is um, the notes you can find on week 21, hilariouschomeschooling.com. Today we're gonna be talking about choosing your resources. Um, so week 21, we're getting closer to the end and I hope that you're feeling more and more ready to um, contemplate starting homeschool in the fall. And I hope it's been helpful to you. I want to start out with an analogy. I want you to pretend that you have not had any time to think about what you want to have for dinner the next few days. And you are very hungry and you're heading to the grocery store. This usually doesn't end well for me if that was my situation. Because usually what happens is I will walk around the grocery store randomly putting things in my cart not really knowing what I intend to make with them. Sometimes inspiration strikes, but then, you know, I have to double back through the store and find an ingredient that I missed. And oftentimes if I didn't look at the recipe, I've forgotten an ingredient or two. And even when I get home and think I'm going to make that meal, I don't have what I need. So a lot of times if you don't plan before you go to the grocery, school, grocery store, you end up being frustrated when you get home with all of the different food that you bought. So I want you to think about how that is with homeschooling as well. If you are just buying anything that you think that looks good or that your neighbor recommended or that you found for free, um, you probably have a hodgepodge of curriculum and you're probably looking at it and thinking, well, this is great. I'm ready to go. But if you haven't thought through your plan for the year, there's a good chance that you are, um, kind of going in a haphazard fashion with what you want to study, that you basically um, don't have the resources, like there, there's one key ingredient of a resource that you might be missing that you really wish you had when you get to that point of the study, it's going to equal some frustration. Not that it can't be done, it's possible, but if you're going to work with your best intentions and your best plans, then doing your planning before you're doing your shopping usually works out better. Um, the homeschool curriculum market is flooded with choices. It didn't used to be that way. It used to be that there were only one or two curriculum companies out there 30 years ago, even 40 years ago. But things have been shifting so that many, many people have said, well, I could do better than this. And they end up writing their own curriculum because they have an expert knowledge in the subject that they're trying to teach their child using a substandard textbook that was the one size fits all curriculum. And so many different homeschool curriculums have been developed over the last 30, 20, 30 years. And you are going to benefit from that because you now have a wide array of choices to be able to choose from that will possibly be able to fit what you're looking for. I don't want you to think that it's like a needle in the haystack where it definitely exists and you just have to keep moving all the hay to find it. You probably still won't find the perfect curriculum, but you will probably find something that fits your family's needs and values very closely. So the temptation then becomes to buy it all. Everything that you see that looks good, you're going to buy it and you're going to try to get your kids to use it. Well, that is putting a lot of pressure on your kids and your job as the grown up, as the adult, is to shoulder the pressure and protect your kids as much as you can from this thinking that you're going to do it all. So you have to resist some peer pressure and you have to decide what is most important and you have to decide what resources will work best in that situation and then um, find a way to obtain those. So you are becoming the filter then or the gatekeeper for what your children will experience over the next year. Not entirely. There's still random things that will happen to your family, random interests that will come up, opportunities that you couldn't possibly foresee. And those don't need to be shunned or pushed out of the way or seen as an unfortunate interruption. There's so many times that God blesses us with things that we weren't expecting. And if we can receive it with open hands and enjoy it for what it is meant to be a gift, um, then we don't have negative attitudes toward those things either. So um, I want to encourage you to plan. I want to encourage you to make your wish list, but I also want to encourage you to remain open for what God might choose to bless you with that you weren't even thinking about and not to be resentful or bitter about that ruining your plans. 
So I've given you some questions that you can use to help make informed choices. The second page in the PDF is quite a few different questions that you can go through. And we've talked about these on other sessions already. So I'll let you read it on your own. But the idea is you're trying to come up with the best resources to fit your family for the topics that you wanna study next year. Um, don't always let a curriculum boss you around. You are the one in charge. You are the one picking out the books. You might appreciate chapter one from this book, but hate the rest of the book. That's fine, use chapter one. Um, and then ditch the rest of the book. You might really appreciate the way that a different publisher um, puts together their math curriculum, but all of those problems um, that they put in the curriculum for the child to do, you know is gonna cause tears every single day. That's fine. You're the teacher, you get to decide what you're going to use from that curriculum. And if it's not every problem, nobody's coming to your house to say, oh my goodness, you didn't follow the curriculum. It doesn't matter. You get to decide what's most important for your family. Okay, that is why I had you do all of those other considerations that we have covered in weeks one through 20. We had so many other things that we talked about because I want you to understand more about um, who your children are and what they need and what your values of a family are and the resources that you already have in your community that you might have overlooked, things that you didn't even know existed. Kind of dig deep and find out what do we have available here because that may guide what you decide to do in the next year. After you have a handle on those issues, that's when you can start to plan out what you want to study and find the resources that you want to use to do your study. Um, back in week 16, we talked about homeschool approaches. We talked about, um, are you more of an unschooler? Are you more of a traditional schooler? Are you very structured? Um, what kind of approaches to homeschool fit your family? And knowing that is going to be able to help you find the resources that you want to use better too. Um, And I said again, you might use the same book and video resource for the whole year, but you might not. The temptation is, of course, to buy everything that looks good and then feel bad that you're not using it and you're wasting your money. That's why I say to hold back on spending your money or purchasing curriculum until you have an idea of what's going to be a good fit. So I've put some um, curriculum sales representatives' phone numbers and um, uh websites in there, I want you to understand that there are two very, very helpful curriculum companies out there, Rainbow Resource and ChristianBook.com. And both of them sell tons of homeschool curriculum. They would love to sell homeschool curriculum to you. This is how they make money is they sell, they buy homeschool curriculum for cheap and then they mark it up a little bit and they sell it to you. So if you're having trouble figuring out what curriculum would fit your family best, and you have already answered all the questions on this page, you're probably ready, if you haven't been able to find the one curriculum that you think will work best for your family, you're probably ready to go ahead and call one of these phone numbers and just talk to somebody. It's not that scary. They are trained to deal with people who've never homeschooled before. They're trained to help you talk through what things are important to you and your kids and what you wanna study and which curriculums might fit you the best. But remember that they are trying to sell you something. They're trying to make money too. So do your best to think through that what they recommend and purchase from them because this is how they have these curriculum experts on staff is they pay them to be available to you hoping that you will buy something from them. So um, don't be afraid to call them. Do have your homework done already so that you don't sit on the other end of the phone just saying um for half an hour. That's not helpful for either one of you. Um, but they may know of curriculum that I don't know about, things that just came out on the market that might fit exactly what you're looking for. Um, you might not be ready to spend that much money, and you can be honest and say so, but you can add it to your wish list and come back to them when you are ready to buy. So don't be afraid to do that. The details are on that PDF um, from my website. And also, I did put together a long list I put it on my website, uh, my blog, between weeks 10 and 11. It's just called a homeschool resource list with links. 
and it gives quite a few different companies that sell curriculum. Um, I also have put together resources every time that I did an academic subject. So the week that we talked about reading, there were pages of resources for that. The week that we talked about language arts, there were some pages of resources for that. The week we talked about mathematics, there were pages with resources for that. Next week's um, topic is science, nature study and science, and there will be pages of resources for that. And week 23 is social studies and history, and there will be pages of resources for that. But just because I list a resource on there doesn't mean you have to buy it and that you're going to enjoy it. It just means that there are things out there that can be used to teach these subjects. And I want you to know that. Um, I do want to encourage you to use what is at hand. You don't have to buy prepackaged curriculum to be successful. You are simply the leader and the guide for your students in your home. Curriculum makes it your job easier because somebody else has already packaged it up and said, teach this and this and this and this and this and this. But you don't have to. You can find resources on your own. You can find free resources and you can put them together into studies for your kids. That will be very helpful. Um, the verse that I love that goes along with this concept is when God was talking to Moses in Exodus 4. Moses was making all these excuses of why he wasn't the right one to go to Pharaoh. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? So he's expressing his doubts to the Lord. Then the Lord said to him, this is verse 2, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. God didn't say, well, you're going to have to run out and buy this fancy thingamajig. Moses is alone in the desert. Moses is herding sheep. What he has in his hand is the job, the tool that he would use for the job of, of herding sheep. It's a staff. God said, it's in your hand already. I'm going to use it and you're going to be amazed. And he did. God had Moses throw it on the ground and he turned it into a snake. That was all that God and Moses needed to be able to prove to the people that it was really God speaking. I'm not saying God is going to turn your washing machine into your science curriculum. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying God is equipping you to do the job that you need to do. And oftentimes we get so sidetracked saying, oh my goodness, well, I'm going to need a thousand dollars and I'm going to have to buy this, 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 and this to do homeschool just like she does down the road. But that's not what God is saying. What is that in your hand? What do you already have in your house or in your resources or people that you know that would be able to help you on this journey? You don't have to go out and spend a thousand dollars. I mean, if you have a thousand dollars and you want to spend it, I'm not going to stop you. But you have stuff in your house that you can use to teach your children. You're going to have to do more work. You're not going to pay somebody else to put the curriculum together for you. You're going to do it yourself, but you can do it. Uh, another one time that the Lord encouraged a hero in the Bible is in Judges 6, verse 14. The Lord had just appeared to Gideon, and Gideon was expressing his doubts about what he was supposed to do. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? The Lord was giving Gideon a job and saying, you don't need anything more than what you already have. The strength that you have, even though Gideon was protesting that it was too little, God was saying, it's enough. We can do this. And so if God is calling you to homeschool and you don't feel adequate or you don't feel equipped, ask God to help you with those feelings of inadequacy and ask him to help you find the things that you need to be able to homeschool this next year without spending thousands of dollars, without putting all these doubts and um, the, the fact that you lack confidence. Don't let those things stand in your way. Ask God to help you get ready to do this for your kids and for him. You're serving him when you're serving your kids. 
Okay, so I wanna go over a couple ideas of what it would look like to put together your own curriculum because that is a scary thought. But remember, if you just take it like six weeks at a time, you can do this, okay? Um, I am going to include this in my PDF with um, the Hilarious Homeschooling download for week 21. But I'm just going to show you what I did. Um, this last year, I had to come up with a unit for my kids on World War II. I didn't really like anything that was already prepackaged. I wanted to spend four weeks, which was 16 days, really diving deep and putting together different resources and tying it together myself. Um, we'll do a little sidetrack right here and talk about meta metacognition, M E T A. C-O-G-N-I-T-I-O-N. Metacognition is the idea of thinking about how you think or thinking about how you learn. It's something that we talk about in educational psychology when we're doing our teaching classes in the college level. And it's something that fascinated me because I really hadn't thought about how I learned to learn. Um, but something really clicked when we were talking about how kids learn and how their brains operate. Um, is very similar to our filing cabinets that we have in our computer um, storage. Like, you know, if you're going to save a file and you want to save it to a certain folder, you go within this folder, within this folder, within this folder, and, you know, however many layers deep, your brain seems to be operating similarly where you have different categories of storage in your brain. And things are put in there um, by folders or by topics, or by categories. And the more that you can do to help your kids learn what those categories look like, the more you're giving them the right kind of box or the right kind of file folder to store information in. You can also think of it as hooks in a coat closet where you have all this information that you're gonna to give to them, but if they don't have any hooks to hang them on, they're just gonna end up in a jumbled pile on the floor. So the first thing that you want to do when you give kids new information is you want to give them the structure that's going to hold that information. Um, the unit that I'm going to talk about with you today, the World War II unit, I decided to organize chronologically in order from the events at the beginning of World War II to the end of World War II. You don't always have to structure things chronologically. When you're doing a science topic, it might make more sense to talk about like, um, let's say you're studying Australia. You could study the landscape of Australia, the people of Australia, the tourist um, attractions in Australia, the history of Australia, the climate of Australia. Um, so all of those things would be different categories that you would be teaching in. So when you're devising a unit that you want to do with your kids, you wanna think first of all about what's the underlying structure and how can I pass that structure onto the kids so that when I start to give them little details, they don't, they're not just leaving them in a pile on the floor. They have a place in their brain to categorize them as you go through it. So um, that was really helpful to me. If you're interested in metacognition, you can do some more research on it. Um, just look up educational psychology, metacognition, how the brain stores information, those kind of things. But just know that when you are planning out a unit, you have some things that you need to consider like what is the underlying structure and also something called task analysis. This is more important for skill topics than concept topics. But the idea that um, if my student's gonna be successful in this skill, what are the smaller skills that are involved that go into that? We covered this a little bit when we talked about language arts. We talked about how complicated it is to write a paragraph that you know there's holding your pencil correctly spelling the right words, remembering capital letters and periods, um, making complete sentences that flow in a certain order. All of those are sub-skills. So when you're trying to teach an overall skill, you kind of need to think, what's the next layer down that they might not have that information yet? And be watching for gaps in the skills underneath that may need to be filled in to be successful in the higher level skill that you're teaching. Okay, enough on educational psychology. I'm just gonna go over this really quick. What I did is I took out this a spreadsheet. I just love spreadsheets. My handwriting is atrocious, so anything I type is much better off later. So I made a category um, 
called World War II Resources, and I typed in every single book that I had in my house about World War II. I've been collecting books for 30 years, so I have a lot of books, and I had already put all of these books in a pile, but I didn't know how I wanted to use these books to teach my kids. I didn't go out and buy anything new except a DVD series called The World at War put out by BBC because I'd heard really good things about it and I knew that my kids learn better using videos rather than reading. So I had all of my resources listed over here and then I took a minute to categorize them and if they were general where they talked about all of World War II together or whether they were very specific and they honed in on only one aspect of the war. For example, what it was like to live in America during that time or the Holocaust or um, one of uh, Darren's relatives was actually killed in World War II and we had information about what that um, mission had been and where he was buried. And so that would be a very specific incident um, that we would reference. And then I had just some other books um, like, you know, the evacuation of the kids from England. So very um, isolated and specific resources. And then, oh, I put everything down here that was about the Holocaust because I had quite a few books about that. Okay, so then what I did is I put down who the author was. And then what I did is I put down what the, like the, the basic notion of it. So um, Torpedoed was a book by Haligman and it was about children on a ship from England because they were being evacuated. Uh, Lily's Crossing is a book um, by Giff and it's about the American side of the war. Baseball Saved Us is just a little picture book by Mochizuki and it's about the Japanese internment camps that were happening in America um, during that time of World War II. So I just kind of categorized them all for myself. The reason I like to use spreadsheets is because you can grab a line and move it up or move it down depending on if you want to change it around. And I did. I mean, once I typed all of this stuff in, I was moving things up and moving things down. What I was looking for um, primarily was I was looking for a text or a video series that we could use to kind of be our spine, our main driving force in all of our lessons. And I found that in the DVD set that I talked about, The World at War. And I also had another one that was called Great Events of the 20th Century. I hadn't ever used this book before. It was just sitting up there um, with our modern American resources. But when I opened it, I found that there were about 40 pages that dealt with World War II. And they were very specific in that they went through the war one year at a time. And so I decided to use that as my spine because it would help break the years up um, on my 16 day study. And I did also go to the library and get a few extra books that had some maps in it because I didn't have anything like that on my list already. So after I had done this, I realized that I had too much information for 16 days. There was no way we were gonna cover all of these things in 16 days and still have children who wanted to live in my home. Okay, there is such a thing as super saturating your children's brains, especially if they weren't particularly interested in the event to begin with. At this point of the year, it was January and I was dragging them through our history curriculum because I needed Josh to finish high school. So at this point, um, there's not a ton of energy or enthusiasm on their part. They're gonna do what I say that they need to do, but it's not that they're dying to get into all of these books, okay? I would love it to get into all of these books and really dive deep. But I knew that I didn't have time to do that either because we have a life. Okay, so let me show you what I did then. A different spreadsheet. Actually, I just went further down on the page, but I put it on a different page for you here. I numbered it from one to 16, showing that we would have um, 16 overall lessons on World War II. And I expected them to be an hour to an hour and a half for each of these lessons. Um, so, I put down here uh, what we would be covering from that one book, The Great Events of the 20th Century. It each, each year had a certain number of pages. 
and we were going to cover that for those days. Um, that would be these pages listed over here. And then this was the World at War DVD that seemed to go best with this. So it kind of goes in order, but there's a couple times where it skips around a little bit. So I wanted to organize those two things together as our spine that would give the kids the background in a short reading and then the background in a, a video series that um, showed a lot of clips from that time period. I mean, that's the neat thing about World War II is so much of it we have video footage for. And so you can actually see primary source documents that were actual video footage of the actual events. Um, here, I just put the title that they had given with each of these pages so that I kind of remembered what we were gonna be covering that day. Um, you can see that there's three or four days that we didn't actually read out of the book or watch DVDs. One of them was the Holocaust. I wanted to cover that using one of the other resources that I had found. And I ended up using We Remember the Holocaust by Adler. And we didn't read the whole entire book. Um, we skimmed through it and read some very important pages. Um, and I just told the kids it's available if you wanna read more. It was very well done and it had quite, I mean, it was like a hundred pages. So we definitely didn't cover it all, but it had a lot of pictures and told stories of many different people. Um, survivors and non-survivors. And then I just told the kids that I had other resources that went along with the Holocaust. And they each were supposed to pick one of them to read during the next few um, days. So depending on their reading level and interest level, there were different books. You know, one was like 30 pages, one was like 100 pages. And I expected each one of them to go through and read one of those books. Um... So the next one that we didn't do any readings or videos for was a project day. And I had this neat book um, called Great World War II Projects that just had um, probably a list of about 20 or 30 things that could be done to help kids understand more about life during World War II. And so each of them were supposed to choose a project um, and then we just worked on it that day. That was our, uh, it happened to be a Friday, so it was a good end of the week activity to just kind of give us all a break um, from such a heavy topic. Um, Josh chose cardboard airplanes. Um, Jessica chose a little flip book animation and Annika chose to make Silly Putty. So all of those things came out of that book and all of them told in that book how they tied into um, World War II. Then the next one that we have that has no readings, only a video, is the day for the picture book presentation. Um, not only were they supposed to read a bigger, thicker book about the Holocaust, I had quite a few um, picture books that went along and told little bitty stories, little side stories about World War II. And so each of the kids chose two books of my picture books. They read them on their own, and then they presented them to each other during that day and, and to us as a group. Um, and so we got some little tidbit stories mixed in with some of the heavier um, readings and videos. Um, I guess that is that that took up our 16 days. Um, what I didn't write on here was another thing that we did. Um, we had a giant map of the world um, and we posted it like on a big sheet of whiteboard and I had printed off the internet um, some little cards that gave a timeline. And so every event that happened on those timelines, we actually found where it happened on the map and put it on that place on the map. And so by the time we were done with that, our map was filled with these little timeline cards that showed where and when something had happened. And we even made a couple of our own timeline cards um, for Darren's relative who'd been killed in the war. Um, and then a couple other things that were just more personal to our family that tied in with World War II. And so that was a big project that we worked on as well. So all in all, it took us a month. It was four weeks in January. Um, I try to give ourselves a really giant project in January because I know that our weather in Iowa is bad almost all the time and that we will have many hours at home. And so I don't mind giving us an intense unit study in January. And it kind of seems to be one of those ways to get something that's big and heavy um, 
knocked out during the month of January. So this um, is not what you have to do. I am simply showing you how you can take a stack of resources that you have already without having to go out and buy something and how you can organize it in a way that leads your kids through the study of a subject. I remember you can give the underlying structure um, and this, this can take a little while because remember, if you're not spending money for a curriculum company to do it, you're doing it yourself. So you're saving money, but the trade-off is your time. I would encourage you to try it. If you don't have a lot of money for a curriculum or you haven't found the right curriculum for your family yet, just choose the topic. Um, this works even better with younger kids because you don't feel the pressure to have to cover a certain um, amount of information like we do in high school. The high school years get a little bit more pressured because you're trying to meet other people's expectations for what you're covering during high school. There's not that same pressure during the early elementary years and regular elementary years. And so you have a little bit more of a chance of exploring what your kids are interested in. So I'd say if you don't have your curriculum yet and you're not in a hurry to buy it, that could be your um, first six week study is choose something that they're interested in that you already have resources for around the house and just go ahead and give yourself, you know, if you're doing six weeks at four days a week, you would have uh, 24 days, but they don't all have to be reading or video days. They can be project days. They can be field trip days. Um, just think about different things that you could do that you already have access to um, and, and try it. See what happens. It, it's something that takes practice. It's a new skill for many people who've never planned out a lesson before, but it's something that's doable and your kids are just excited to spend time with you um, and let you lead the way. Sometimes they want to lead the way and you could let them lead a lesson for the day. Um, it, just experiment and see what works out best and you'll learn more about your kids and learn more about your family at the same time. Okay. That was a lot of information about choosing your resources or using resources that you already have. Um, week 24, we are going to discuss Teaching from Rest. It's a book by Sarah McKenzie. If you haven't had a chance to buy it yet, I encourage you to find it so that you can um, read this. It's a very small book and it's very reassuring. So I hope you can have a chance to read it. All right. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day.